Okay, so I'm going to start with a question. My question is, what do testers do? And I assume there's some testers in the audience here who could help me out with that. Any, any testers here? Oh, good. I was hoping there might be one or two. Yeah, okay. Uh, anybody got an answer to my question, what do testers do? Somebody, somebody put up your hand and yell or something. Hey, I can't hear. Sorry? Validate. Okay, good. Good answer. I'm okay with that. That's cool. There are no wrong... Okay, there might be wrong answers, but it's a very, very few wrong answers here. It's not a trick question. Anybody else? Ask questions. Really good. Really good. Yes? Investigate. Investigate. Yep. That's another true thing. Yes? Learn. Learn. Uh-huh. Break illusions, yes. Test. I think that's, that's a really good answer. Anybody uh, think maybe testers have something to do with quality? Yeah, maybe something to do with quality a little bit. No? I'm not going to go into quality assurance. I know that's a contentious topic, but uh, look. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because I used to be a full-time tester. Now I'm a part-time tester, part-time everything else. Uh, and back when I was doing that, I had a job where I thought, testing is about quality. Yeah, my whole mission is really about quality. I want to give a quality product to the end user. I've always had a passion for usability and user experience. I used to work closely with designers to try to create a product that's not only working well, but is a delight for users as well. And I think that that's not uncommon as a mindset for testers. Uh, it, it was very rewarding in some aspects when I thought that the customers were receiving good value. Sometimes it could be quite upsetting because sometimes the product manager would want to ship a release before all of the bugs that I thought were important to quality were fixed. But for the most part, it worked well as a tester mindset for me, right? But then at some point, maybe about six or seven years ago in my career, I was in a team that moved into a large testing team in a large company, and it called itself Engineering Productivity. But it was made up of test engineers and software engineers in test. So there were people with testing in their job title, with testing backgrounds, but their goal wasn't quality, it was productivity. And I thought at the time, actually, this made me quite depressed because uh, I didn't get into this whole testing game to become what essentially seemed to be internal tools development. I'd actually been an internal tools developer at the start of my career and moved into testing. So it was really odd to move into this organization that was saying, no, testers have to care about productivity now. And the reason behind this was that uh, they thought that, so testing is an activity, right? Uh, and they thought, well, it shouldn't be a role. I agree with that. That's fine. Uh, their idea was developers should be doing the majority of testing activities. They should be trying to automate all of the tests that they can. They should be able to uh, do exploratory testing on their own. And this should be what a high-performing team looks like. And then, yes, you can have a test engineer on that team. OK. But the test engineer shouldn't be trying to do testing. God forbid. Uh, the test engineer should be trying to help developers get better at doing testing themselves, kind of like a, a testing specialist, a testing coach type of thing, right? So even though I got quite depressed hearing this at, in the first place, uh, I thought, I, I'll see how this goes, because this team did have a really solid reputation for high-quality products. Whatever they were doing, even though it seemed really weird to me, it worked. So. I gave it a shot. I stayed there for a while. And I did learn a few things from being in this engineering productivity team. So it was interesting that even though I wasn't doing testing anymore in terms of testing the product, I could still apply a lot of my testing skills to, towards this goal of productivity. Because I started to look at the team rather than the system as the thing that I was testing. So that way, I could start to form an idea in my head of what this, uh, what this system was supposed to look like and what the bugs were in that system. How could this system perform better? If, uh, it's kind of like if you're testing a system 
and you want to uh, make sure that it performs well. Well, that's kind of productivity, but you now you apply it to a delivery team. So that's kind of an interesting way to think about it. So I started looking at the release process from end to end, seeing how code turned into a product, which turned into some kind of deployable artifact, which went to some environment and had some tests run on it, et cetera. And I could analyze feedback loops. And I could see where the bottlenecks in this system were. Uh, so thinking about it as a testable machine really helped me with my goal of understanding productivity. So for example, some of the things that I would do is I would make some tools to help test automation be done faster. So if developers were having a hard time with the test uh, automation tools that they already had, perhaps I could make one that was a little more user friendly for them. And that would speed up their ability to write better automated tests. Or uh, there were some interesting tools coming out of my department, like one was uh, one that would uh, go through all of the bugs in the backlog and clean them up periodically. So it would slowly deprioritize any bug that was uh, older than, I think, a month. And it would notify everybody that this was happening. And then over time, uh, eventually, they'd get such a low priority that would be closed. And that would help keep the backlog clean. And so that would help people not have to wade through lots and lots of irrelevant bugs that nobody was ever going to address. So th that was kind of cool. You're increasing the productivity of the team. You're not wasting so much time. If somebody goes on holiday in the team, then you, you try to think of ways to explain to the team, OK, th that person's going on holiday, so now we have to compensate. Otherwise, we're not going to be as productive as, as we were. Right? Uh, you can, uh, so making these things transparent to the team really helped to aid in productivity. So I thought, that's interesting. Uh, but then I, I started switching my focus again, because some years back, I was invited to speak at a conference called Business of Software Conference. And this was very different for me, because usually I speak at software testing conferences like this one. So it's a tester audience. But Business of Software Conference is a CEO and a CTO audience. So this was a very new experience for me. I wasn't so worried about the CTO side of things because it's a technical background. But for the CEO side, there are quite a lot of uh, CEOs who don't really have a strong technical background. And what I find with uh, the folks who don't have a strong technical background is that they tend to not understand testing very well. They don't find it particularly interesting. Uh, and often they sort of see it as a necessary annoyance. And I thought, how am I going to make a talk about testing interesting to business people. So I thought, what do, what do business people care about? What I usually hear them caring about is, why isn't testing done yet? Testing should be done by now, and I think it should be done, and it's not done. So I thought, well, that's interesting. They seem to care about deadlines a lot, regardless of what kind of uh, er industry they're in. But it was weird to me that they care about deadlines, because deadlines are a weird kind of thing in uh, software development. In, in my experience, uh, for product managers, they have this idea in their head, which is very much left over from the let's ship software in a box days, right? which is this idea where we get this idea, uh, we do a bit of development, we make some fixes, and then it's done, and everything's fine, and we have a launch party, and we will have no bugs ever again if we do all our testing right. And it's, yeah, it's, everybody in this room knows that's a lie, because what really happens is a bit more like this. <laughs> we have an idea. We do a bit of development. We do a bit of fixing. Uh, the fixing created more bugs somehow. Who could have told, thought that that would happen? Uh, we call it done because we have to, because it's just getting too late. We'll make some more fixes in production. Uh, oh, I just thought of some more changes I want to make in production, yeah. So the weird thing about this is that this is almost an industry standard at this point. So I don't know why anybody has this idea that it would ever be anything different to this. Uh, <laughs> uh, because the, the thing is that we're always changing, especially in this modern age. We don't ship software in a box anymore. And because we can change things so easily, we do change things very easily, right? Uh, so for a product manager or a CEO, uh, what I thought they really, we really can't provide them something that matches their expectation anymore. I don't think that that's really something that's going to happen. What we can do is we can provide them with 
uh, predictability. We can provide them with a way to understand this bizarre process uh, without having to know about the technical difficulties uh, that go into that process, right? So just give them some idea so that they have some feeling of control over their own business uh, when all of this crazy stuff is happening and, they don't, and, and usually it's quite confusing, right? And I thought, well, predictability is another interesting thing to, uh, that I can apply my testing skills to. See, if I know about bugs ahead of time in the development process, then that actually makes the, anything that happens post-production a little bit uh, more predictable, right? Because if, I've, if we have a huge backlog of bugs that haven't been fixed yet, and we know we're going to ship the product on this day, then we know that there are going to be these problems, right? Because we've tested it well. If we know somebody's going on vacation, like I mentioned before in the development team, then we can know, OK, maybe this is going to add a little more time to our development, right? We're making these sort of things transparent to business owners is the sort of thing that we can do to help them remain a little more calm in the middle of the storm. Uh, if we know about changes ahead of time, we know that there will be a risk impact. So it may make it a little less surprising when we find that things do end up with a little more um, bugs in production, let's say. So that got me thinking about the nature of production systems in general. And I thought, it, it's interesting because I could apply my testing skills, my analytical skills in uh, getting information out of a system and providing it to somebody to this weird web of production. So if we think about production systems, uh, it's not just this system sitting there with nobody ever looking at it, right? There's a whole lot of people interacting with it at any given time. And it's not just our customers, it's also operations people, it's administrators who might have special privileges. Uh, there's things that happen in the world that could somehow affect our system. Uh, for example, uh, if we had a malicious user, they could impersonate a nice user uh, and get some special uh, privileges through the administrator by pretending to be that person, right? Uh, so th it's not even just that these people are interacting in a one-way uh, nature with the production system. They're interacting with each other, and the way they interact with each other also in impacts the system. So now we've got this complex system that we've got to analyze, which isn't even written in code, and it's, and it's something completely outside our control. And that's fascinating to me, because that we can test as well. And if we put that together with the system under test that we know and love, and the delivery team that we can test as well, then we've got this whole ecosystem that we can test. We've got this uh, thing that we can look at in a holistic way and think, hey, everything here interacts with each other. Everything here has an impact on everything else. And getting information out of one part of it isn't really enough. We need to understand the system as a whole in order to know how things interact with each other and get some of that predictability, quality, and productivity. And this became very important to me when I was working at Google because I had the privilege of working with an ultra-large scale system there. I worked on Google Maps. It, it was just the most complex beast I've ever seen in my life. Uh, to give you an idea of how complex that was, at any given time, no developer in the entire organization could tell me what the system architecture looked like. Yeah. Right? And that's because it was a moving target. I remember there was a very senior engineer who was, uh, I was shadowing for a while, and we walked past a string diagram on a wall. It, was, it looked terrible. It was just a mess. And he said, you should memorize that. I'm like, OK. We walked past it the next day, and he looked at it again and went, oh, that's deprecated, that's moved, that's <laughs> Not a chance. Not a chance, right? Uh, but, of course, they have a lot of infrastructure and process put in place to cater for this so that they don't have to know about the entire architecture at any given time. But think about traditional testing methods. And when I say traditional, I mean full-stack end-to-end testing. When you have something that's got thousands and thousands of individual microservices in a complex web together 
and then have hundreds of different user interfaces interacting with that. And some of them aren't even the sort of interfaces that human beings can interact with. And I'm not even just talking APIs. I'm talking about things that are scraping massive amounts of data off the web and off other sources and just crunching it through a big pipeline. Where are the ends here? How do you test that end to end? There are no ends. Even if you tried to test it end to end and found one end and another end and went, oh, I'm going to test it from here to here, uh, it still wouldn't help because once a bug is found, you have no hope of finding out where in that iceberg the bug actually originated. So uh, I had to think of a different solution to this. And this is what made me start thinking about production systems themselves quite differently. Because I used to think, back in my small startup world, <laughs> Production system, yeah, you make some things, you deploy it to production, we'll just leave it there, everything's fine, the dust is settled until we do another release. So everything's golden, let's not worry about it. These days, I think of it more like this terrifying beast that's always moving, always evolving, always looks different, and just has its tentacles in everything. So it was a little bit terrifying, but learning how to deal with an ultra-large scale system helped me to work out how to deal with any system in this large ecosystem, in this holistic way. And this is the model that I ended up evolving in my head, which was uh, that you use transparency activities, which are essentially testing skills, right? But I don't say testing because that word is so closely associated with specific tasks, I would rather expand it to a broader definition of transparency because what we're doing is we're making things more clear and we're getting information from somewhere and we're making it clear to another party. And at the bottom you can see I've got these outcomes of predictability and productivity and quality. And I think the interesting thing about having these outcomes is that depending on the context you're in, different uh, different outcomes are going to be more important compared to the other outcomes in that place. But at any given time, it's useful to start thinking about these different outcomes. I've done a workshop in the past where I've just put this up on a board and I asked the team, how, what can you measure with regards to these outcomes in your team? And that team actually came up with way more ideas for that than I would have thought of myself because they're testers, because this is what we do. We think about these types of things. I think it's important to start thinking in a different way because I've noticed a disconnect between how testers see themselves, especially experienced testers, and how everybody else is seeing them. And I see arguments online about this constantly, so it's not a new problem. Uh, I, thought, I thought, it's not just me, right? Let me just make sure that it's, it's not just me that thinks this. So I did a survey. It was an informal survey on Twitter. I asked the same question that I asked you at the beginning of this talk, which is, what do testers do? Uh, I got quite a lot of responses. Uh, but can you see how many different responses I got? So every response I got, almost every single one, was a multi-part answer, had four or more responses within the one tweet. They only had 240 characters. I'm convinced if they had more time, because some people gave me a blog post and said, here's my answer. Uh, so yeah, I, th there's a lot of different answers you can give to this question. And they're all correct, I think. Uh, and the, the reason for that is testers are doing so many different things. There are people in a tester role, self-identifying as testers, and they're doing so many different activities because you can apply the testing skill to so many different things in a really useful way. And if you're interested, these were the most common responses. Gather information, transparency, check expectations and requirements versus reality. Pretty basic, right? Discovering and reducing risk, very, very predictability, right? Yeah. So, uh, these, these top results were not surprising to me, but I thought, what happens if I ask developers the same question? <laughs> what if I ask the people who work most closely with testers what they think testers do? Their top response wasn't in any of the tester answers, and the top tester response wasn't in any of the developer answers, and this actually surprised me 
because this is such a massive disconnect. And what also surprised me is that I asked this question on Twitter. These are people who know me and follow me and talk to me, and they still gave this answer. Uh, some of them were pretty snarky too. I got tested by the developers all day. They're really annoying, like, oh, God, okay. So, <laughs> but yeah, if even developers don't actually know what we do, then really what hope does the rest of the world have? And, it, and you'll notice a pattern here as well. It's that it's very narrowly focused around a very narrow definition of testing. It's looking for edge cases, finding bugs, that kind of thing. Whereas testers were giving more answers like, uh, oh, we're, we're doing sort of more broad things. We're learning, we're investigating, we're asking questions, we're, uh, uh, we're doing stuff with environments, we're looking at the release process as a whole, you know, this kind of thing. It, it went a lot more broad. And to me, this, this shows in, this is invisible work. And I see this in organizations I go to all the time. Testers are doing invisible work. And it's not getting recognized. And I, and I think that it's useful work. It's sort of this gap-filling work that I see. Because the reason for this is that testing is an activity. It isn't a role. The other thing I notice, if I go to places and try to explain to them, hey, developers should also do testing, right? Which is a, a very agile concept. I don't know what it's like using the term very agile, but okay. Uh, but it's a, it, it's a, it's a concept I, I, full, I fully agree with. But what I get back from that is, what are the testers going to do? Even the testers get upset about this, by the way. A lot of testers will be actively sabotaging my efforts to try to get developers to do more testing because they think that they're going to be out of a job if the developers do more testing because they're strongly identified my job is to do all of the testing, even if they're doing so many other useful things, right? And I think this fear comes from the fact that the, even if they understand themselves that they're doing lots of useful things, they know that their role is misunderstood. Because even if they know I'm doing lots of good things, maybe the business people don't know that those things are, d are happening because it's invisible work. So how are they ever going to get recognition for their work if they're not doing testing as their primary activity? But uh, here's some examples of how I've been using my testing skills in ways that aren't traditional software testing. So I was working at a place where there were a lot of missed deadlines. Uh, the teams were working slower than they wanted to. They were releasing about once every two months at best. Uh, and they really wanted to get continuous delivery happening. So they really wanted to get faster at this. I thought, OK, productivity problem. I've been through this. That's OK. And using my experience, the first thing I wanted to tackle was the nature of test environments, because I thought, if there's one thing I know that's going to be slowing this place down, it's going to be one really horrific test environment. So I asked the test manager, can you get your team to get us these numbers? I want to know. How much time is getting spent per week fixing or maintaining a test environment? Who's doing it? I bet it's the testers. Uh, and also, how much downtime do you have in this test environment? Right? Because everybody uses this test environment. We know that. Uh, it, it impacts everybody's work. After a few weeks, we got some numbers back. 16 hours a week spent maintaining this test environment. And everyone was shocked by this number, by the way. It, nobody knew that this was happening, and I think for a few reasons. One of them was that testers were doing it, and they weren't speaking up about it being a problem. I think they were used to just having to put up with stuff that was awful, and they didn't think that anyone would listen to them, which is sad. I think the other reason they didn't notice is because it was a shared resource. So somebody would rotate into this role to look after the test environment, and they just knew that it wouldn't be their problem after a week. So. Maybe this was just a bad week, right? But once this became visible, the manager could take this to upper management and say, hey, this is a problem that's not just affecting testers. This is affecting the whole team. And she did something really clever and converted those hours wasted into dollar values, which really made the manager sit up and pay attention and go, oh, wow, OK, we're losing huge amounts of money in terms of productivity every week here. This is a problem. And that's why it wasn't getting fixed, because nobody could see this problem. It wasn't visible. There was no transparency. But once it was visible, 
the manager got permission to put together a task force, a team, to actually try and solve this problem. And then it actually did get fixed. And then it, actually things did get a little bit better, and the releases were actually able to happen once every couple of weeks instead, instead of once every couple of months, just from this change, just from this transparency. So I worked uh, at a really fun place. Uh, just to let you know, I lasted all of five weeks there because before I quit. I was threatening to quit at the end of week one. Uh, it was insane. Anyway, one of the fun things that happened there was that at the end of every day at 5 p.m., I would get put on a conference call with about 30 other managers, and they would all be yelling and panicking because testing wasn't done yet. And they'd be going, Trish, why isn't testing done yet? And I'd go, it's my first day, and uh, <laughs> I'll find out for you. So I went around to the teams that I managed, uh, and I, I asked them first, uh, what, what are you doing? <laughs> are you, uh, how, are you, how are you doing? Are you going to be finishing your testing on time? And so the first team I went to, uh, they, they said, yes, we're doing OK. I think we'll be done on time. Uh, I said, OK. So the reason the managers are all yelling at me is because you keep giving them this graph, right? And this graph was generated from a spreadsheet that was about 140 columns wide by about 40 columns deep. And it started over here with some numbers like uh, amount of tests that I've run, amount of tests that pass, amount of tests that fail, amount of tests I'm going to run, amount of tests I'm thinking of running. I'm just, it kept going. And then they do all kinds of weird calculations to this to infinity, uh, which nobody should ever do, those poor numbers. Uh, so I said, what's the deal? Why do you have this graph? Uh, she said, oh, that's, that, you know, that's a standard testing thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, she got those numbers from, they only had one license for whatever tool they were using for test management. Uh, and the way that they would collate data from this tool is uh, every day the lead would export all of the test cases for the day out of the tool. And then she'd email them to all of the testers. And then the testers would randomly pick test cases they liked the look of. Uh, then, they would, um, then they would manually test an API, which was, which was where you'd uh, put the request, the XML request, into SOAP UI, and then you'd get the re response back and you'd manually verify line by line all the XML. Uh, and then when they got those results back, they would give them back to the lead, whatever they happened to have. The lead would quickly try to put those numbers into a spreadsheet. Sometimes they'd be wrong anyway, apart from the fact that it was all duplicated. Uh, and then that would turn into a big graph. And, she's, uh, and that's the process. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God. Uh, so that was team number one. I said, but you're doing fine. OK, that's all I want to know. Team number two was doing what I like to call stealth agile, which is where you're, you want to do agile, uh, but the entire organization is doing waterfall. So you pretend to do waterfall, but you're really using story cards and stuff um, on a secret wall. And, uh, and then when management asks you, uh, can I have all of your crazy waterfall metrics? They just make up things and then give them to the <laughs> managers. <laughs> so they were just blatantly lying, basically. Uh, I said, how are you doing? Uh, is testing going to be done? They say, that's a dumb question because we're doing agile, and so we just test as the story's done, and I'm like, OK, fine, whatever. That's good. Uh, <laughs> so I come back to my desk, and I think, OK, I've got two choices here. I can either try to tell these managers that they've been lied to all this time and make them panic more. Or I can try to speak to them in a language they understand, and I will uh, just try to make the truth reflect, reflect the, in the graph. So I did that. <laughs> I just sort of went, OK, fix this graph, make it look like if it's going to be lies, at least it'll be more accurate lies. Uh, and then I sent that off to the managers while I tried to think, what am I going to do next? Um, so the, at the end of that uh, daily meeting, uh, the, the head manager talked to my boss and told her, that is the best graph we've ever seen. <laughs> anyway, it calmed them all down, and it had a really good side effect, which was that now the teams weren't spending two hours a day making graphs, so it actually increased the productivity of those teams. But the moral of this story 
is, uh, first of all, never work there. But second of all, uh, <laughs> these are testing skills. I investigated, I found data, I, I tried to make um, the actual story more transparent to the people who cared about it, right? I tried to give it to them in a language they understood. Uh, I needed to increase transparency in this organization for things to get any better. So my last example is where I was working in a place where there was an interesting type of production issue happening. It was interesting because there were production incidents being caused by testing in production that was happening from our own employees. So our own employees were putting data into production that was uh, causing some problems. So to clarify, this was a system where all of the data you put into production is visible by everybody, publicly visible, right? It was a public resource, so uh, if, you put, if you update something, everybody can see it. Uh, for, for various reasons, occasionally people would say, well, the only way I can test this is I'm going to do it in production, so I'm just going to make a public resource visible and call it a funky name, ha-ha, uh, uh, or maybe I'll modify an existing resource in there, and, um, uh, and that'll be fun as well, just to, for a more realistic test case. And this had caused incidents that had cost a lot of money because they would uh, modify real businesses and that would cause problems for that business, which would cause that business to lose money. So this was not a trivial problem. This is a big problem. The weirdest thing about this problem is that it was really hard to tell who was doing it. It wasn't the one person. There were a lot of different people doing it and it was very hard to track them down because they'd make a new account each time and it was very hard to figure out where that was coming from. And even then, if you tried to track down by IP address or something like that, sometimes there were test devices just lying around. People would just pick one up and go, oh, a test account is probably using the test environment, uh, which it wasn't. <laughs> uh, so I thought, okay, I mean, uh, this actually was an organization of smart people, so this was a weird problem to have. Uh, and they weren't... They weren't evil people, so I don't know why they were trying to risk quality in this way. It was a really weird thing to do. So what I did to try to measure this problem uh, was I set a trap. Uh, there was, a, there was a, an internal web page that said how to actually set up test data in production. And it was a really long document that said, big red letters, do not make fake production accounts. But if you do want to do that, here's how you do it, and here's about 50 things that you should do to safeguard that. Yeah, go ahead. So I got rid of all of that, uh, hid that document somewhere where only my team could access it, and replaced it all with, uh, do not test in production, but if you do want to test in production, come and see Trish, she'll tell you how to do it. Uh, so I put my email address there, and I got up to three emails a week from people wanting to test in production. Yeah, when they emailed me, I would set up a meeting, and we'd have a friendly chat, and I would <laughs> explain to them that they probably didn't need to do that. Uh, if they really thought they needed to do it, hey, here were some good alternatives. There's a test environment we have. Uh, there, there's some tools that we can provide you with that will help you to do whatever the heck it is you're doing. Uh, you know, leave it to my team. I can get someone else to do it for you safely. That's fine. Uh, but I would log it every time because there was a lot of requests because I wasn't just looking to solve individual problems. I wanted to solve the bigger problem. Why was this such a common problem? And so over time, I was able to collect a lot of data that showed me uh, some patterns and I was able to prioritize all of the tasks that I needed to do in order to solve this problem. Uh, one of the problems was that on certain mobile devices, it was actually impossible to connect it up to the test environment. So if you wanted to test on an actual device, then you had to actually wire it up to production, and that's why a lot of people were doing it. But further to that, they didn't really need to be testing on a real device. They could have done it on a simulator for whatever they were actually doing. So they, and they didn't know about that, right? So that was something that we could solve to, to try to get the device thing working, but also try to make it very obvious to everybody that this is an alternative for you. There are simulators here, you can use them. And uh, one of the other reasons was that sometimes uh, a developer would not want to set up another team's service uh, in the test environment, so they'd just wire it to production. Uh, it's a read-only operation, it's totally safe, they say. But then they would leave it there, 
and the next team to come along and use the test environment would be using a production service and they wouldn't know about it. So that we could fix as well. But we needed to put processes in place to prevent this from reoccurring. So it was interesting in that case that I was essentially using my testing skills to test the organization. It was almost like I put in an automated test or a monitoring system of some sort. Uh, in this organization to get some data out of it and work out how does this organization work? Who is actually causing this problem? Where do these bugs originate? How do I solve this, right? And then work out why weren't people, uh, why, why didn't people know that this, this was causing problems? You know, how can I better educate everybody? It was a very large department, right? Uh, several hundred people and there were people coming and going all the time and that was part of the issue. So we had to look into changing the onboarding process, things like that. But, uh, but even though the solutions often were out of my hands, they were more at a departmental level, as a tester I was still able to test this organization. So the reason that I think that thinking about a system holistically and using transparency as a focus is really important is because I, I do see a trend of having these teams that I mentioned at the start of my talk where developers are doing all of the testing and there's no test specialist on the team anymore. And I've seen teams work really well that way, don't get me wrong. But I think that what those teams are losing is some really essential skills from some people who have built them over time doing software testing. And they need them for more than testing. There's a lot of things going on in software teams that are being done by testers that are just invisible work. People don't see them happening. And I think it would be really, really not just sad to lose these skills from the industry, but I think it would be really dangerous to lose these skills from the industry, especially when we're looking at more modern complex systems when everything is getting more integrated. So that beast of a production system I showed you, that's just going to be one beast for every system in one, at some point, I think. Everything gets very integrated with each other. We've got Internet of Things. We've got uh, developers just hooking up to every API they can find <laughs> these days. Uh, everything gets very tightly connected into one massive system now. Everything has an impact on each other now. And we've got the rise of artificial intelligence, which in many ways is a black box testing problem. And we need people who are able to think in that way to analyze black box systems, to be able to uh, solve these types of problems as well, right? We need test specialists in our teams. And I don't want them to disappear. I think it's, it's, it's really critical for the industry that we keep them around. But if we keep aligning ourselves with this um, narrow definition of testing only, which is very poorly understood, despite all of our efforts to educate everybody to the contrary, then it, it, it's never going to get any better that way. We, we do risk losing some people. So that scares me, and I, I do want to address that. And that's why I, I think uh, this transparency model could be a useful first step towards moving towards solving that problem. And that's my message. <laughs>